I warmly welcome uh, to the Music in the Library, library World session organized by IFLA New Professionals Special Interest Group. It, it's great that so many of you were able to join us today. My name is Magdalena Gamunka. I am NPSLG convenor and the host of this session. For many years, we have considered the different functions of libraries. There has been a growing focus on libraries as a meeting point, as a space for creation, as a changing and dynamic spaces that empower our society. If libraries aim to uh, connect society in these ways, we should con consider the importance of music because music is the one of the most wonderful manifestations of human creativity, a reflection of our culture and history. With that in mind, in this session, we would like to show the way music is present in our daily activity and think together uh, what uh, space we provide uh, for music in libraries. Uh, music was very important uh, for our group uh, last month. We organized the webinar by perspectives on music librarianship um, meetings where we, uh, sing, we sang our favorite songs and the first music contest for librarians. All these activities uh, we uh, were supported by, by our partners. PEVWEM edition, Legimi platform, EAM and IFLA federations, and Polish uh, section for music libraries. Um, we have so many things to cover today. On the next slide, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, two parts of our session. Firstly, we will have four presentation where we can uh, find out more about access to the music and the role of the music in public and academic libraries. Then there will be time for your questions and to our speakers. And finally, a, mo a, mo a magic moment for our participants uh, of the NPSG Music Contest 2021. We will announce the winners. So let me introduce our speakers. Georgina Beans from Australia, Madeline Sharkelford Washington from the USA, Brett McCanders and Fabio Oliveira also from the USA, and last but not least, Gustavo Diaz from the Paraguay. For next slide. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Georgina Beans, the president of the IAM, International Associations of Music Libraries, Archives and Documentation Center in Australia. Georgina is a speaker of the international conferences and specialist in music librarianship and information and business management. In her presentation, we will find out more uh, about um, access to the musical involvement how it is, um, um, how programs, initiatives, and collections su support uh, access to the musical involvement. In her title there, of her presentations contains one of the five music rights. We will find out more just in mean, just a few seconds. So Georgina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Magdalena, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to give this keynote presentation. I'm presenting to you today from the lands of the First Nations Wurundjeri people in Melbourne, Australia. The Wurundjeri people have been the custodians of this land for thousands of years and acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge other First Nations people who may be participating in this conference. I look forward to meeting you for the questions and answers after the session. So please note down your questions and comments to share with the speakers. We'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences about music in libraries. 
For the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to share the passion for working with music collections and our music seeking library users, whether for leisure, education or professional needs. Many of us working in libraries have music backgrounds and working with music collections is second nature. We learnt music as children, studied at school and university and combined this specialist knowledge with general library qualifications. You may be in this category and undertaken a placement or internship in a library with music collections or may have been a volunteer or perhaps are applying for or have a role in a music library. And perhaps you are interested in ideas for integrating music into libraries and don't have formal qualifications in music but understand the importance of music in human lives. And others of you may be working in general library environments and placed in situations where you may feel uncomfortable advising or working with music. So I hope the following suggestions provide guidance and inspiration on the potential of engaging music collections and programs in libraries. The quotation from the title of this paper has inspired this presentation and to have access to music involvement through participation, listening, creation and information. This powerful statement is the third of the five music rights established by the International Music Council and is aspirational for all children and adults in this world. A big ask, yes, but it is a right that fits well with services offered by libraries where the public state, national, educational and other specialist music libraries. The five music rights are a set of values developed by the International Music Council or the IMC. These core beliefs have guided IMC, its regional groups and members worldwide in all of their work and actions from its foundation by UNESCO in 1949 after the Second World War until today. The IMC is the world's largest network of organisations and institutions working in the field of music. And through its members and networks, IMC has direct access to over a thousand organisations in some 150 countries, all eager to develop and share knowledge and experience on diverse aspects of music life, including the promotion of access and values of music in the lives of all people. The five music rights were first proclaimed at the IMC General Assembly in Tokyo in 2001. They are inspired by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, all adopted by the United Nations. The Penn Charter, which promotes world literature, also provided guidance. The International Association of Music Libraries, Archives and Documentation Centres, otherwise known as YAML, is a member of this organisation and uses the music rights in its advocacy and outreach to support libraries in justifying the need for music collections and services. And it is this right that I'll expand on now to provide case studies and ideas for how you might consider introducing innovative and forward thinking ideas into your own practice collections, facilities and programs. There are many specialist libraries around the world that focus on music. There are music libraries that support music conservatoire and university music schools and faculties, school music libraries, specialist research libraries and archives, orchestral and broadcast libraries, and I could go on. Music collections also exist as part of large comprehensive collections in national, public, school and university libraries. They may have experienced music librarians or librarians with some music knowledge taking care of the collection development, client support and promotion. But many libraries do not have specialist librarians. This may be due to lack of funding or low priority in policy planning, a lack of understanding of music needs, difficulty finding qualified staff and changing cultural priorities in the community. Collections may not have been kept up to date or may lack innovative approaches and appropriate promotion. And this may lead to lack of use and may even cause some libraries to be the victim of rationalization and become redundant. So it is important that music is placed as a priority in libraries to ensure people are given the opportunity to access music collections and services, enabling engagement in music through participation, creation, listening, performance, and access to information. So I'd like to unpick the actions around this third music right to see how we can apply these in our libraries. 
participation and creation. Libraries are at the centre of communities, whether it be in a town, city, school, university or workplace. Libraries and music are a perfect match for sharing and providing opportunities through participation. The presentations following this keynote, I know, will be providing examples of this, but I'll share some services and programs that have been successful in providing a place for music participation as well. Uh, I've attempted to be inclusive where I can, so please be forgiving that in this short time, I can't include every language and diversity in examples. So a space to create. Many libraries offer a space to create and play music as an individual or a group. Many people do not have the appropriate environment in their homes, nor necessarily the money to commit to purchasing an instrument. So at the Green Square Library in Sydney, Australia, they have a very impressive music room with a grand piano and a view, and it has additional recording facilities and capacity of 20 people and can be used for rehearsals, small concerts and recordings. And in the piano room at the National Library of Russia, they don't have a grand piano, but they have two pianos side by side, assisting in music selection and rehearsals. Other options um, are an electric keyboard with headphones, which can be useful if space is at a premium. This is an example um, at the City of Melbourne Docklands Library here in Melbourne. And another supportive music service is the ability of recording facilities. These can be so prohibitively expensive to hire or may not be available in smaller towns. Locating them in a library allows equitable access. The Docklands Library here in Melbourne has a state-of-the-art recording studio available. Users need to undertake some basic training before booking uh, and it's very popular I hear. And the Sunshine Sunshine Coast Library in Queensland has a podcast studio available for booking, enabling community members to create their music related podcasts. Instrument lending is also a feature of some libraries. The Brooklyn Public Library in New York has a well used collection, and I love the way the Enfield Public Library in Connecticut, uh, USA, has a visual catalogue to assist the user in finding their next musical challenge. Other services to encourage participation in music include the opportunities to borrow digital devices and provision of Wi-Fi hubs. These kinds of services assist those unable to afford devices, access the latest technology, or may not have easy access to connectivity. Uh, Toronto Public Library in Canada offer Wi-Fi hotspots to community members who do not have the internet at home. And another Canadian library, the Fort St. John Public Library in British Columbia, has a popular program to lend out iPads to those who don't have a suitable device. Perfect not just for ebooks, but streaming music, sound, and video. And I love the idea uh, of a library supporting a public radio station. For example, the CPL radio, supported by Cedarburg Public Library in the USA, is a way to promote the collections, performance, and information about music. Libraries are perfect examples for concerts and music presentations. The following examples provide ideas for creat creativity and partnership. The State Library of Victoria here in Melbourne has partnered with the Professional Orchestra Victoria to present a musical story for children called Little Puggle Song. Presented in the specially designed children's quarter, these sessions are popular and this event is already booked out for September performances and we cross our fingers that the library will be open then. State Library Victoria here in Melbourne um, is, is a very old library and um, incredibly popular with our um, members of the public. A regional library in Eastern Victoria regularly presents Druin story time full of songs and stories. Music is an integral, integral part of this program to assist in language learning skills. And at Manitou Springs Library in Colorado, USA, lawn concerts are programmed with local musicians, enabling live music performance with social distancing. And the project at Eau Claire Public Library in Wisconsin, USA, was introduced during the coronavirus pandemic when so many musicians were out of work and unable to perform live. The project involved local musicians recording videos and loading um, their videos onto the library homepage for streaming and sharing with the community. And the North Shore Public Library in New York State have been offering virtual concerts. Further connection with audiences online is exemplified in this program from the Brimbank Public Library here in Melbourne. 
hooked into a reading festival, this rock music trivia session was offered online and making it accessible to a larger audience. In the UK, there's a very successful program called Get It Loud in Libraries. This program has been running since 2005 and it's delivered in geographical areas that are generally outside the major metropolitan centres with low live music position, especially for young people and families. And it also enables libraries to shape programs to assist in cultivating their own audiences, generate income and bring live music to their area. There's been a trend in libraries around the world to integrate makerspaces into library services and programs. Makerspaces provide an interdisciplinary opportunity for all ages to explore creativity and technology. Music fits perfectly into programs in makerspaces alongside the 3D printers, woodwork, robot building, paper, glue, and so on. And here are some great music space activities that have been collated on Pinterest. There's so many ideas to implement in sessions for library users around music. And here are some amazing Google Chrome Music Lab experiments with music, which would be perfect for incorporating into makerspace programs for children and adults. So let's move on to listening and information about music as a right. One of the key areas to consider are the resources that a comprehensive music collection might hold. Collection development policies are one of the key tools for ensuring music is included in library collections. It may take some proactivity to ensure music is included in a policy. Justification can be sought in understanding your library community needs by seeking input from community musicians, developing aligned programs and events, and prioritising funding to support initiatives. At this point, I thought it might be of interest to consider the diversity of libraries and their users and how it is important not to forget that this music right is for all. And in addition, how important it is to establish standards for services. This slide shows selections from the minimum standard guidelines for library services to prisoners developed by the Australian Library and Information Association, which is our professional body here in Australia. Music is mentioned in the library collection policy, encouraging the provision of books on music. It's also suggested that the library should organise and support a variety of activities and programs that promote reading, literacy and cultural pursuits. This could include music related programs, which provide creative use of time and improved quality of life, enhancing social skills and self esteem and resources to support these programs, such as music scores, sound recordings, video and instruments could be added to the collection and appropriate spaces and recording studios created for music making. When considering the wider needs of music resources in libraries, books and information databases are easily accounted for. So I'd like to focus on music sound, music scores and music on video as the key areas for consideration. Music sound traditionally would be available on vinyl recordings, tape and CD. But now, as we know, digital is the preferred format. Personal streaming subscriptions are ubiquitous with their millions of tracks. And this is not an advertisement for these services. I'm only highlighting them as the most popular services, um, such as Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music Prime, Deezer, and many more. But these streaming services are not accessible for everybody. Some are unable to afford with their monthly annual fees driven by card payment systems, and not everyone has the appropriate devices to play them on. Libraries can provide alternatives, allowing their users to join via their library memberships. Freegal, Hoopla, Naxos Music Library, and Alexander Street Music Online, with their classical, world, popular, and jazz tracks, are some library subscription models available. And if a user is unable to afford a listening device, the library could provide the in-house computers to um, enable this, or perhaps lend out appropriate devices. And then of course, there are the many digital sound archives available from libraries, museums, and archives that offer free streaming, often relating to the particular culture or country and historical in context. Explore the opportunities available in your country and other cultures that your library users may be interested in and create access to them via your web pages. Um, the next area to consider is the provision of music scores. Again, the type of score is dependent on the type of library that you might um, provide. A public library might be focused on beginners and elementary manuals, 
popular music and some classical scores, whereas a university is interested in more advanced and fine editions of music. There are numerous websites offering public domain music and you'll see those on the left hand side. Um, this includes music that is out of copyright and freely available. The International Music Score Library Project and the Choral Music Wiki are two of the most well known sites. And there are many national and university library collections that offer digitized collections of scores, especially for music in the first half of the 20th century and earlier. For more contemporary music scores, there are conglomerate digital collections available for subscription by libraries. I provide again just a sample. Babel scores for contemporary art music scores. Encoda is well considered for its chamber and orchestral music. And Alexander Street Classical Music Library have fantastic classical scores. They all contain highly regarded editions for the discerning musicians. And music videos are another popular method of listening, learning and sharing music. Again, we all know the many freely available sites for accessing content such as YouTube and Vimeo, but there are models for video streaming available for library subscription with have um, fantastic music content for sharing with communities, providing access to many titles and tools that may not be available freely. As I near the end of this presentation, I thought the following initiative worth sharing as we move forward into a world much changed by recent events. It is also a time to rethink how we offer our services, collections and spaces to our communities. At State Library Victoria here in Melbourne, a call out for submissions for a new program called Alchemy was made earlier this year. It's a new program to support the development of cultural experiences and creative businesses and to engage with the library community especially after the long closures during the pandemic. I was particularly taken with one proposal and I quote from our local paper. It will be an ambisonic library with long form recordings from library spaces in 3D audio to put listeners into a virtual reality space designed around sound. Sound and music artists are developing the idea with members of the Society of Visually Impaired Sound Artists who have worked with institutions across the world to rethink how audio description can work. They will mix and edit recordings that are captured from all corners of the library, including some that visitors never see. It's going to treat the library as not just being about the printed, written visual material, but as an extensive sensorial space I thought this particular program ex exemplifies new ways of thinking about our libraries, exploring new partnerships and providing something for the curious and also perhaps something to extend and engage people who might not normally be able to ac access experience sound and music. And now to the end of my paper on a more practical note, I mentioned Yamo earlier. This is the key professional organisation for the network of international music libraries and music librarians. Its key aim is detailed on the slide. And there are 26 international branches, a number of institutional sections, including broadcasting and orchestra libraries, research libraries, libraries in music teaching institutions, public libraries and archives meet um, to discuss their particular needs. There are annual conferences, national and international, educational opportunities, a journal and an active social media presence. There is also the Large Music Library Association in the United States of America, America and it's also considered to be the USA YAML branch. Uh, it's devoted to music librarianship in all aspects of music materials in libraries, supporting advocacy, a journal, conferences, and an active email list, which anyone can join. And you might be interested in pursuing some training for supporting music in libraries for you and your colleagues. Um, so the, the British YAML group have a um, session called Music for the Terrified, Your Fears Dispelled. And here in Australia, we ran a session at our last conference um, and the slides are available on our website called Knowing the Score. Um, and the MLA in America offer workshops, webinars and online training. And the YAML Germany webpage has lots of um, training assistance with links off to relevant library schools and other information. 
So thank you very much for listening to my uh, paper. And I look forward to answering questions in the question and answer session. Um, it's been a pleasure to um, talk to you about uh, the particular third music right. And I hope it's given you lots of ideas, inspiration and enthusiasm to consider how you can share music in your libraries. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to hearing my fellow speakers. And thank you, Georgina, for your presentation. Uh, next speaker, Madeline Shelkeford Washington, is a coordinator of the music library at the University of Houston. She finds herself in music, leadership, and politics. Madeline is a flutist, vocalist, and choreographer, as well as librarian. Her presentation will be an opportunity to know more uh, about the multimedia studio and uh, the music impact on students' careers. So let's see how Mozart was taken over in the MD Anderson Library. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Madeline Shackelford Washington, coordinator of the music library at the University of Houston. I am really happy to be here with you today to talk to you a bit about our um, Mozart takeover in the music library. So give me just one second so I can share my screen with you. And I believe you may be able to see my screen now. Yes. Wonderful. This presentation will chronicle the participation of two library students, student workers as performers in promotional videos for the Hamill Foundation Multimedia Studio in the MD Anderson Library at the University of Houston. A service to assist students, staff, and faculty in creating quality productions this collaborative project highlighted dramatic coloratura soprano Krista Poppy and mezzo soprano Aaron Schifranek, both students in the Moore School of Music. These students recorded two arias from two different Mozart operas in the Hamill Multimedia Studio. The videos feature both of them in action in the studio, as well as capture their testimonies as to how the recording services offered in the library impacted their careers and their professional practice. The centerpiece of the promotional video were dialogues about the impact of the library's recording services. Krista Poppy was one of our graduate student assistants in the music library and already having completed one degree at the University of Houston, Krista was well aware of the recording services offered by uh, the University of Houston. However, she just didn't think that it was anything that she could use. I'm really glad that I asked her to be a part of this project. Please enjoy Krista. My name is Krista Renee Poppy. I am a soprano. I am currently pursuing a Master of Music degree in vocal performance and pedagogy at the University of Houston Moore School of Music. The technicians know exactly what's going on. They help you and if you feel like maybe one part was not good enough or you want to go back and cover something else or check levels, they're very good about going back and making sure it's to your standards. I think it's good to have a resource on campus that you can use to go back and record and record material for classes as well. Undergraduate students at the Moore School of Music often have to do theory assignments where they create a song or create an assignment and they're required to record it or perform it in class. It's good to know how much your voice has grown in time and even as a pedagogue to address your own voice and listen for the little quirks in it and the unique parts of it that you can learn and teach from as well. 
Erin Shafranik, another of our graduate students that works in that worked in our music library, was almost complete, almost complete with her studies and had never even heard about the Hamill Studio or even knew that the library offered recording services. I sure am glad I asked her to participate as well. Enjoy Aaron. <laughs> My name is Erin Shafranik. I'm a mezzo-soprano. I'm a graduate student at the Moore School of Music, and I'll be graduating with my master's in music in vocal performance. It's really convenient to have the Hamill Studio on campus, and it's free, and you have techs who can, you know, do whatever they need to do to your recording and edit it, so it definitely helps with needing recordings for your auditions and submitting those. It's just, it's a professional, easy and convenient tool to have as a student. The recording process was super easy. We just, you go online, sign up for a time and you bring your recording of accompaniment, whatever you need, and you just sing. And if you like the recording, you're good. Or if you want to re-record, you can do that. I would definitely recommend using the Hamill Studio to other more School of Music students because just simply of the convenience of it being on campus and um, you get a really nice clean recording of your craft and it's free. <laughs> Cannot stress that enough. The University of Houston Libraries opened the Hamill Studio in 2011. It's located in our main library, the MD Anderson Library, in the South Computer Lab, close to our makerspace, um, on the first floor of the MD Anderson Library. The studio is a professional grade audio recording facility with two soundproof chambers to separate performer from producer. Supporting the needs of contemporary musicians is a very, very special thing that I'm very honored to be engaged in here as coordinator of the Music Library at the University of Houston. I'm happy to know that our students value and appreciate the recording services that are offered by our library, and it thrills me to know that we can support them in becoming the next generation of professionals in an ever-changing arts ecosystem. I wish you good health. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Madeline, thank you very much for your presentation. And our next speakers, a very uh, idea in my head. Sometimes librarians wonder, is it possible to organize a performance in a library or to have a cooperation between librarians and the musicians? Definitely yes. And our next speakers, um, Brett McCandles, and Fabio Oliveira uh, from the Rowan University will describe or collaborate project to include education for performance and benefits for students, libraries, and music as well. So Brett is a performing arts uh, librarian at Rowan University and PhD candidate in musicology at Indiana University. Dr. Oliveira is a performer and educator with a wide variety of experience as percussionist, improviser, and conductor. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Thank you very much to the colleagues here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you all. My name is uh, Fabio Oliveira, along with my colleague, uh, Brett McCandles. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you for attending our presentation today. Our session is going to discuss a joint project between a librarian and a studio professor uh, in integrating information literacy with performance, uh, utilizing some of the limitations of our library space uh, to spark a learning opportunity for students. So the idea of our project came from juggling two different goals that we each had in mind. 
Um, as the performing arts librarian, one of my main concerns has been to develop practical skills and experiences for students that they can rely on for their careers. And much of this instruction has been to get students to think about how and why they might do or use research and information in their careers, particularly as performers. Uh, in, in the fall of semester of 2019, I proposed a semester long activity to the Rhone University Percussion Studio in which each student should consider how context and repertoire shape each other. In other words, the context of music making, including the space a performance takes place in, the size of the venue, its lack or excess of resonance, the audience in attendance, even the sonic history of the space, all have significant potential to shape repertoire. In other words, what music is programmed and especially how this music is played inside that space. So this project, um, however, had to work within the limitations set by our library administration, which required that music played in our space be no louder than 80 decibels and also incorporated information literacy and strategic searching as integral part of the performance that were occurred within the space. So many libraries host performances, many of them have concert halls and other performance venues, but this was taking place in a space that really did need to be somewhat limited in sound, and this provided an interesting challenge for students. The limitations of space, time, and volume were crucial in defining a real-world scenario for selecting repertoire and the steps that students could use to find suitable pieces. So we set up a 75-minute instruction session two weeks prior to our concert in the library's instruction procedure lab. And in this session, students discussed the limitations of our concert space and ways that they choose repertoire, strategies for searching and locating scores in our library catalog, and then identified pieces that were for their instruments, locating them on the shelves and browsing nearby scores, and finally analyzing the scores that they found for suitability within our space. And these addressed multiple frames that the Association for College and Research Libraries um, have for information literacy, including searching as strategic information, information creation as process, research as inquiry, and scholarship as conversation, since they were all working together to choose repertoire for this concert. Well, our, our percussion ensemble concert in the Performing Arts Collection presented a uniquely interesting and challenging context for which to prepare a concert. Uh, the, the repertoire consisted of a combination of music students found while browsing in the collection. Uh, it also consisted of solo repertoire students were working on or could learn that either suited the, the library space or could be adapted for that space. Uh, we also included percussion ensemble repertoire that was suited for this particular performance. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we also included music that was in the ensemble's fall 2019. Uh, repertoire. So we, we would like to highlight how significant this concert experience was uh, for the students. Uh, having to listen deeply to the space really significantly changed their way of playing their pieces. And the concert was well attended by library staff, patrons, and friends and family of the nine student performers. Everyone was exposed to contemporary percussion repertoire and discovered new kinds of music to explore. And it was extremely satisfying to hear one of those pieces that they performed, a movement from John Cage's Amores, being performed in the very space where it was found two weeks earlier, as you can see in the picture on the right. So in reflection of our project, I was very satisfied with how students engaged with the collection, learned how to search for repertoire, considered musical aspects that they could locate in a score that was fit for performance, and even performed repertoire from the activity, encapsulating the research process from beginning to end. I speak to my students about the importance of understanding how their daily percussion practice routine, the pieces of music they're working on at that time, their actual craft as musicians, how this all relates to the society in which they live in. Finding ways to connect the repertoire they choose to study to real world scenarios 
helps to generate a more meaningful connection with their applied music instruction. This project provided a great means for students to exercise this, highlighting their agency over what they choose to play and how to make their performance meaningful for each occasion. And we hope to see this as an ongoing series and are in early stages of planning for fall 2021. Um, and we wanna thank you for hearing about our project and we look forward to any questions in the Q&A portion. Thank you. Uh, Brett uh, and Fabio, thank you very much for your presentation. And our last uh, speaker, Gustavo Diaz, uh, works in uh, El Cantaro as a coordinator in Paraguay. Uh, El Cantaro is a community and nonprofit organization uh, which uses a power of art to change the society. Uh, in his uh, presentation, Music Education in a Doma Library, El Cantaro Popular Via School, we will find out more how cultural events and music uh, create a network with local community and uh, also find out more about the role of library there. So Gustavo, tell us more. Well, thank you very much, Magdalena. Uh, my name is Gustavo Diaz. I'm a general coordinator of El Cantaro Popular Bioschool. And today I'm going to talk about the music education in, in the Dome Library. You might be wondering what a Dome Library is. So let me show you around what we do and then how we integrate music there. We believe in music, culture, and creativity as a means to transform society. As Georgina said, we are firm believers that uh, music, arts, and culture are a human right. So we try to offer services and workshops for kids, young and adult, in our town called Arewa in Paraguay. We're in the middle of South America. And I would like to show you a little of history of our school so you can understand the context of what we do and who we are. We began in the, in the streets of Arewa because we didn't have a space before. And this process was very interesting because we were on the way of the people. We, people came over and music was a very important component because it was a very attractive uh, workshop. As you can see, these are the, the kids who wanted to learn guitar. We offer classical and popular guitar lessons. And this is in a public space in Arewa. But we also offer other types of arts and manifestations. But it was very, uh, it was a, uh, it involved a lot of work to go to the, these public spaces and take all of our equipment. So we try to find out someone who could sponsor us in uh, renting a place we found this really torn down house. But the beauty of our school is that it's a community school. So we offer these workshops for free, but we also invite people to uh, give back to the school and the community. So we were able to uh, rebuild and paint. And well, there was a tree in the toilet. So you can just imagine how torn down this building was. But thanks to the help of everyone, we were able to uh, set it back and started giving concerts. We also had a library there and we continued with our music classes under our roof, although it had some leaks, but it was much better than before. Unfortunately, or fortunately in retrospect, the owner of that house uh, raised our rent like twice or three times the price. So we couldn't afford staying there anymore after all that hard work. But that was an opportunity for us because we found some funds and we bought this land, which was a junkyard that only had this mango tree. And we started what we called the natural building with our community. So we uh, stepped on mud, and we built our own bricks and we did very many different techniques. 
and this is a phrase that I would I always like to to say that a person can't build a house but 10 people can build 10 houses and that's the magical synergy of having a community that has a shared vision this is our main hall or our main building which we call Oawasu in Guarani it means like the big house where we have our concerts and it's like the main workshop place also but then we also needed to bring our all of our books that were stored <laughs> in boxes so we build this dome library which you can see in the back and our original design was this we wanted to uh, do a library or a space that didn't use wood so it could be a little more ecological and it was a little crazy people didn't think it was possible but we finally did it and this is how it looks inside and we have more than 3,000 volumes in this library that's all donated by uh, people from our community. We also had originally a computer lab inside. And the main uh, purpose of the library was to promote reading because this is the first library of our town. So we did a lot of workshops with kids, but also with teachers and uh, with parents so that they could promote reading and literacy in our in our community and it was a very interesting process because because we didn't have any library people weren't so used to reading but what i was asked to talk about is music education in the dome library so our space, our library uh, also was a venue and still is a venue for music. So uh, we also give a lot of performances there. Many people who come and visit can also share different instruments for kids to learn. But we also have our regular uh, music classes like guitar and here you can see we have different levels of, of, of guitar training. We also have uh, singing and choirs inside this library. We also have percussion classes here. And recently we also started a string ensemble. As I mentioned, we offer all of these workshops for free. And I also wanted to end like sharing you what else we do because music is a big component but it's not the only component of our school so we these are like our main axis of awareness crafts communication and technologies and we also rescue cultural and artistic uh, values of our society and maybe you might be wondering what is popular a popular school or a popular education it's a more horizontal way of learning where everyone has uh, something to teach but we all, all are also all learners and the idea is not to put content into people but to transform ourselves and also to transform our society we are uh, not part of the government but we were recognized by congress in 2018 as a social and cultural interest because of the impact we've created in our town and in also our country and these are the main themes that we work on, youth engagement, critical pedagogy, community arts and creativity, sustainability and social inclusion. We also offer other workshops, as I mentioned, like uh, uh, printing on t-shirts uh, and other crafts like traditional crafts from our country. We also have a little maker space where we have like Arduino kits and started doing some, in, some projects there. And we recently also got a fund by the Japanese embassy to have an arts and craft production and gastronomy 
and on the top part, a social technology lab. So we've grown a lot since our beginnings and we have an area to cook, we have an, a computer lab. And just as a compliment, it's not only music, but many things that we do in our school, like puppets, circles, films, storytelling that I just wanted to share because it's very interesting. And sorry for the quality of our, of our images. Sometimes in the beginning, we didn't have good cameras. <laughs> this is a very interesting show. That's a shadow, shadow theater. And this specifically was about the history of music. And here we have rock and roll and other puppets. We also had the honor of having one of the most important classical guitarists from our country come to our school. So here you can see the amount of people who came to see her. <clears throat> and what we're doing now in the pandemic in the library is incredible because uh, the people started reading much more than before. And that's a positive side of, of what's happening besides all the negative impacts of, uh, of the pandemic. And we're doing a lot of more promotion of local uh, artists. And we also have a, a sidewalk fridge library. <laughs> Since many people couldn't access our school in 2020, we took the books outside back to the public spaces so people can deposit and share books there. We were also giving a lot of kits because uh, the crisis was economic also. So we gave food to a lot of community members and we also started a, a book club. And two weeks ago, we, we gave out the prizes for a very interesting contest called Cartas a la Tierra, which means letters to, to Mother Earth. And we hang all of the praises from these uh, participants in our mango tree. So to sum up, we have 14 years of of service to the community, more than 800 participants a year. We did more than 150 creative workshops. We have the first community library of the city and a multi-purpose room. And if you want to know more about our school, we have a documentary called Voces de Barro, which is freely available in YouTube. But the main thing of our school is that we want to transmit community values through example. We want to become a self-sustaining school, a reference center. And we're part of a Latin American community culture movement, which offer, which is like similar to the philosophy that we're doing. And we would love to see more cantaros in uh, Paraguay and across the world. So, this is our popular school and I really appreciate your time for listening and hope you have a lot of questions coming up. Thank you. Uh, Gustavo, thank you very much for sharing uh, your projects uh, and the com your community project with us. And there is a time where we, you can uh, ask questions to our speakers and uh, find out who will be winners of NPSIG Music Contest 2021, the first music competition for librarians. Please click the link in, on the uh, conference website to the room and we will see there. Thank you.